Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to a special edition of the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks in the Howard community that are blazing the trail and making moves. Today, we got two, two amazing guests on the show. Our first guest is Charlie Lewis. He's a, a lifestyle real estate agent by day, but in, in, in the beautiful uh, city of uh, New York. But then by night, well, really 24 seven, man, he's the president, the new president elect of the HUAA, which is the Howard University Alumni Association. So Charlie, I definitely want to welcome you to the show. And of course, we got Quentin James. Some might call him the king maker, but uh, Quentin is the uh, founder and president of the Collective Pack. Um, resume is is insane. Um, you know, founder founder and president of Collective Pack. Um, he's a Howard graduate, um, African American studies. Uh, he was the Black American uh, director of Ready for Hillary Pack, in which he uh, recruited over fifty thousand African American grassroots donors and over three million grassroots supporters. Um, Quentin is also married to none other than Stephanie Brown James. Um, she was a former trustee at uh, Howard University. Also from 2009 to 2013, Quentin served as a national board member for the NAACP. So I definitely want to uh, say what's up and thank you, both of you brothers for coming on the show. Um, but I'll start with uh, some statistics. I was on the Collective Pack website and I saw that um, some crazy statistics. So U.S. House of Representatives, black people currently hold 52 out of 435 seats. Um, the U.S. Senate, we hold three out of 100 seats, which is 3%. Um, in Congress, we hold 55 out of 535 seats. Uh, statewide elected officials, 18 out of 346 seats. Statewide legislature, 771 out of 7,383 seats. And even more so, some other statistics. Um, I remember reading that like in the state of New York, a white man is more likely, can, can find a job quicker. A white man with, a, with like a, a, a criminal record can find a job quicker than a black man with a college degree. Um, I, I noticed that the richer you are, the older you are, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. Some other statistics, while people of color make up, what, 13% of the people, uh, black people, we only make up 13% of the population in America, but we're 60% of the prison population. And so we have this conversation on the heels of the verdict from of Breonna Taylor um, and now we want to talk about, you know, we want to focus on black men and how we can increase, you know, black men voting. So Quentin, you know, I want to start with you, you know, how important, how on a scale of one to 10, you know, how do you view this election? You know, would you say that this is the most important of our lifetime or the most important in American history? You know, how, what do you think? Yeah, uh, scale of one to 10, this is a, um, probably a 12. Uh, and, and I don't say that lightly. Um, I think every election cycle, people say it's the most important election of our lifetimes. Um, so we kind of heard that a lot. But in reality, this one um, really is critical for all of us, uh, but definitely for Black men. Um, the opportunity that the elected officials who will be chosen in November have to reshape the next few decades in this country um, is unprecedented. A few reasons why. Uh, 2020 is what we call a census year. And so all of us, if you haven't done so, make sure you fill out your census. It's due the next couple of days. Um, but that census dictates um, how many elected officials are in your community, uh, but also how your community allocates the resources for everything from schools uh, to economic development dollars um, to dollars to solve homelessness, um, all the things that we probably care about in our communities, um, the, the census is critical in determining that. Um, that's number one. Number two, 
uh, this presidential election is going to be critical. Um, whether you are Democrat or Republican really um, doesn't matter. You shouldn't tolerate racism um, and white supremacy. Uh, and so we are hearing white supremacist, um, not just ideals, but policy recommendations um, coming out of uh, uh, being proposed in states and cities and even our federal government. And so we will dig into it, I'm sure, in this conversation. But yeah, I mean, this, this is critical. Like I, I talked to a, uh, a ton of Jewish uh, folks, Jewish donors, um, uh, and, and folks who have a direct connection to what happened um, to, the, to the Holocaust. And, and they're frightened, they're scared. They are, they are seeing a rise, not only in this country, but also around the world, of what they thought they defeated when, they defeat, when we defeated Hitler um, in, in the 40s. Uh, but, but that same fervor around white supremacy, around neo-Nazism, around fascism, it's creeping back into our politics. Um, and so those are complicated concepts that, again, we may not have time to dig, dig into, but I would just say, yeah, man, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. Wow. Charlie, as a, as a brother that, you know, born in, I mean, you know, a little bit older than myself and uh, Quentin, you know, how do you view this election and the importance uh, of it? Uh, well, first, I'm going to give a shout out to all us HU brothers on the call. So I just want to big up that because we got so much talent here that, um, you know, that can't be uh, uh, denied. Uh, but I'm, and I'm happy to be with Quentin because I followed them and, and his wife, Stephanie, and what they've done with the collective pack. Um, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate you, Josh, being on the show. Um, yeah, I came out of Howard in 89. Uh, I've been voting. I'm from Georgia. So I'm from the South. My father grew up in Jim Crow, Georgia. Okay. He saw it. He was a guy who was involved in local politics statewide politics and in national politics. So you have to say it kind of grew up in me, in my system. Uh, I saw it based on the fact that he knew that getting involved on the local level was what was going to make change happen. So he wasn't just involved in local politics, but he was also involved in the local board of education, the NAACP, you name it. He was politically active, civic, social active, I mean, socially active and civically active in his community. Um, and so I saw just through uh, his works and what he did over the years of uh, working in the community and working on the city council and working with the mayor's office and how he needed to get things changed. So even for instance, we had a store that, we, that I grew up in and it was on the corner. Well, the, the, the ability for him to go down to the courthouse to move to where the street was because it uh, created traffic in his store or it created, uh, you know, it prevented future accidents. That was the power that I saw. So he knew that the decisions that he were making were, were being heard. They were just not opinions. And when you deal with that, that is when you realize, oh, this is the power. And that's what get people enthusiastic around this thing of voting and they see that. And then from that level, I saw him work with, you know, uh, governor at the time with Governor Zell Miller when he was a Democrat before he switched over and became a Republican. And that got me politically active in Y Club when I was in school. And so therefore I was up on Capitol Hill doing summer internships. So for me, I've been indoctrinated in the purpose and see how policy is made, how decisions are made, and how it will affect you on the local, statewide, and national level. And then from there, he was instrumental in working in, the, in South Georgia with uh, President Jimmy Carter and getting Jimmy Carter elected coming from the state of Georgia. So it's important. Quentin gave this, uh, he said it's a 12, I think it's a 15 on a scale of one to 10, to be honest with you. Uh, when, the, when the courts, because basically right now, if people don't realize it, the math does not lie. We will, it will be six versus three on the courts. And so when you start thinking about, this is the 50th year of the Voting Rights Act from 1965. 20, we are 50 years in, I mean, 55 years in, excuse me, 
the anniversary of this. And with John Lewis and all the people that came that worked hard, that 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 march, that saw what Jim Crow South looked like, it's imperative because the court decision now impacts so many from your health care. And we know in the black community based off COVID and what we saw in the disparity of our lives and our livelihoods and how we live, we are an occupational hazard because we are on the front lines out there with these workers. So for us, it is important that we get involved in this election. It is important that you know who your local officials are. It is important that you know who your state officials are. And then of course, we know on the national level what's happening there. So this election is really, really important. So we, we, we hear that same thing every year. This election is, is so important, it's so important. You know, I mean, I vote, you know, I kind of came up in the voting era of, you know, Obama. I mean, that was just a whole field of story. But when you look at history, you know, I can see why black people, and, and I know we're talking about black men, but I can see why they may say my vote doesn't count or it doesn't matter. I mean, when you think about Reagan and you think about drugs in the black community, you think about even how how we backed and supported um, Bill Clinton. And then you think about that crime bill, you know, put a lot of black people behind bars. Um, there, There is a portion of the population that is not pleased and, and they feel like Obama could have did more for uh, black people. But now we had this, <laughs> we had Donald Trump here, you know, and, you know, it's still, you know, to me it's surprising how hard people go for Donald Trump, you know, given everything that he's done. But, you know, why is it that even now with everything that you said, everything that you both said, why, why, why is it that black men, you know, and we're not saying all black men, but why, you know, even celebrities are coming out saying, well, I'm going to vote for the first time. I've, I've never voted before. You know, if we just take Donald Trump out of the equation, why does it have to take a Donald Trump or whatever to get us out to the polls? Quit. You want to take that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a uh, today with uh, this. You know, at least when we're recording this, Breonna Taylor decision came out, um, and I can tell you, man, it's hard to stay hopeful. It's hard to believe in 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 hope and change, and that our votes can make a difference. I understand that, um, but I think it's important to know our history as well. Um, in that this struggle that we are in um, is not going to be solved simply by one vote or 10 votes or a million votes. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a singular strategy, a part of a larger strategy that we have to employ. Um, so yes, uh, is it imperative that we all come out and vote this November? Yes, it is. Um, but we got to come back and vote in 2021 too, right? Many mayoral campaigns in New York City, in Cleveland where I'm at, in Atlanta, for instance, right? These mayors have either re-elections or you can elect a new mayor. And so some of the issues that we care most about are local issues as well. Um, and so I think part of it, Josh, is we gotta do a better job of civic education. You know, there's a great uh, video out by an uh, Ohio artist named Yellow Pain. Um, it's called, my, you know, my, my Vote Will Count. But he talks about how we all think about the executive, right? You think about the president, think about the mayor or the governor. Really important roles. We don't think about Congress or city council or school boards, people who actually write laws, right? Um, so one thing that we've been saying this, this cycle is if you want to change the laws, you got to change the lawmakers. Um, make sure people who are writing the laws know you, know your community, um, look like you, represent you. Um, that's really important in the process. Another big challenge in politics is money. Um, you know, in the Supreme Court, which we just talked about with, with Charlie, the Supreme Court, you know, passed a um, or made a decision back in 2010 uh, called Citizens United, uh, where now money equals free speech in this country, meaning I can raise unlimited amounts of money um, and spend it to elect people uh, to, to public office. That is, in my opinion, asinine that um, you could spend a billion dollars <throat> to promote your candidacy and that be completely legal. How then do you say this um, process is equal to all? It's not if you don't have a billion dollars or 
ten billion dollars, right? And so that's one of the challenges. Um, but I, again, I, I could I could go on and on. I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I would just say I think um, it's imperative that we understand voting is one tactic um, that that we can employ. That is it's critical and important. But everything else we talk about buying back the block, making sure our kids are educated and going to HBCUs and we're supporting HBCUs. Um, uh, I mean, everything else that we talk about, right? Having healthy communities. Um, hell, you know, you can't uh, g get out here and do what you need you to do in terms of voting and and, and being, um, you know, entrepreneurs and everything if you're dying, right? Um, and so all these things uh, play a part of it. And we shouldn't just think about voting over here as like the silver bullet. It completely is not, but it's definitely something that we have to do um, to, to keep the ball moving forward down the field. Uh, also, too, I just want to piggyback on what Quentin said, which was civic education. Um, that has been lost. It's been lost in our schools. It's been lost in our homes. Um, and a lot of people don't get that education of understanding to connect the dots. Basically, I call it the supply chain of government. So understanding that you start local and you go state and then you go national. And the most important people that really matter are the people in your local community. Uh, and in the black community, what tends to happen is that people come in only doing the every four years or every two years on the off cycle and they go to the churches and then um, they, they, you know, get the photo op at the churches They meet someone, you know, in a diner or go to a barbershop and then they think, you know what, that's campaigning and they see that now it's pandering. So basically what you have to do is understand if you are a person who is running for office and you are a black person, what black people should do. Number one is we don't have some of the resources, the data, the analysis that we should have in our community. But in order to understand our community and our culture, you have to do a deep dive. And if you're going to uh, ask for our vote, you got to understand the culture and where we sit and what our grievances are. So for instance, we know what's been going on in Flint for years, right? With the whole rust and um, um, in the pipes and stuff of that nature. But just take it to the local level of Flint. Okay, you got rust in the pipes of Flint, but yet when you go into the community, how are people getting access to clean drinking water? And then when they do get access to clean drinking water, is water uh, uh, there in a, you know, plentiful of, are they not giving out? So a lot of people know, hey, well, my pipes are rusted in Flint, but at the same point in time, the government says they're gonna bring in water, but then they run out of water. Or it corroded my pipes. What are you gonna do for, my, for me, the city? What is the city government gonna do for me when it comes down to fixing my pipes into my home? So therefore I now can get clean drinking water or, or you know, and so it's just a domino effect of what happens in our community and why we feel neglected. So why we don't vote is because we see repeatedly on repeat a cycle of where we feel left out and we don't feel like we're at the table. But that is the important part of getting involved. And with groups like Clint, uh, Quentin and his wife, the Collective Pack, that's what they've been ch charged to do, which is go into these smaller communities in the state level nationwide, and they are re-energizing and revigorating people who want to vote and who want to have a seat at the table, and they're putting money behind those campaigns and getting those people in the right position of power yeah. to make that change. And yeah, so, I'll go ahead. Josh, just one, one more quick thing. I just want to make sure we understand this point. Like, Politics works for some people. It ain't working for us, right? So you mentioned, you know, Reagan, you mentioned Obama, like there are some communities that benefit no matter who is in public office because they know how to use power. And, and for so long, we've been um, miseducated to think that it's only about voting. Voting is one aspect, but it's also mm -hmm. about our money and it's about our lobbying and it's about all these other things that we have to do in the process. And so I just want to make sure like, Government does work. It's not working for our people right now. And that, that is a challenge that we got to fix. And then two things in America that work is capital and access. And a lot of times we don't have the capital in order to get, and then a lot of times we don't have the access. And what I think when in the eighties, when we grew up, when I grew up and Jesse Jackson's were the ones that were out there in the field and they were campaigning, 
it was politically screwed, skewed that it was all about being in government and being the mayor, but not really going after the capital and the access to be in the boardrooms to really make the decisions. And what I see now as a real estate uh, 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 person here, broker here in New York, is you see where dollars go and how dollars are across the country. You know, school zones are where people want to put their money. So they have the best roads, they got the best sidewalks, they got the best sewer systems and all of that. But that is why they have the higher return on their home, their equity, and they get equity. And that is how people make decisions about what happens in their particular community. So you just have to get involved. But it's also one thing that you mentioned, Josh, which I think a lot of people, especially the younger people, get confused, and it's that 1994 crime bill. That 1994 crime bill was a result of years of crack that were uh, uh, devastating our communities and a lot of our uh, major metropolitan cities. And in order for that bill, that bill, yep, Clinton was involved, Biden was involved, but what got that bill over the hump was when the Republicans came in and put the three strikes, you're out in the bill. That is the, that is the, that is the point that gets lost in the conversation of the crime bill. The Democrats didn't want that bill. They didn't want that in the bill. But in order for it to get signed, the Republicans put that in the bill. I don't think the Democrats at that time knew exactly how that was going to affect the African American community and the Latin, com Latin community. And because of systematic and institutional racism, that is what turned that crime bill into such devastation that it is today and why so many black men. Yeah, your, your mic is froze. But um, so I um, Quinn, I want to circle back for a second. I mean, you mentioned that um, there are there is a segment of the population that benefits no matter who's in office. And I know that uh, I think it's called like the Koch brothers or something like that. They oh, donated, yeah. yeah, they donated like ten million to one campaign, nine million to the other one. So whoever was in office, you know, they were no, definitely no, 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 no. They oh, they spent ahead. about a hundred million dollars a cycle on candidates. Man, a hundred million dollars a cycle. So uh, when we talking money like that, why, I mean, and, and we go over everything. We talk about the crime bill. We talk about all of this stuff. I mean, and here we are, we, we three guys that are very well educated, you know, and when we look at the people that don't vote, it's people that aren't, that have low education is people that are younger. I mean, if I'm running for if I'm if I'm a politician running for office, I mean, how much time am I going to spend even trying to get black men to vote? And if and and mm -hmm. and even Quinn, in, in in your work, I mean, what are the issues that you see facing black men? Like, what are some compelling things? Like, hey, this is why you need to get to the polls right now and and vote. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the number one motivating factor is reforming our broken criminal justice system. Uh, so when people connect the dots between that prosecutor who's running unopposed every single time um, to why they're getting caught up with these crazy charges, that motivates black men to get out and vote. When they connect the dots of these dirty cops getting off when they kill our people, um, to, you know, electing a new mayor who will appoint a new chief of police. Um, they connect the dots. And so it's breaking down the system to folks. Um, everybody's pissed, rightfully so, about Breonna Taylor. Um, you know, that attorney general was elected uh, last year uh, with no fanfare. Um, there wasn't a movement to elect, you know, a reform-minded attorney general in Kentucky. Um, and so it, it, it also you know, some of this is a family conversation as well in that we have to educate ourselves, right? All of us, our, our audiences, um, and we got to step up and, and show up every election, um, not just when it matters, not because, you know, we're so reactionary to the problems, we got to be more proactive. That, that's number one. But, but to your point around money, um, 
listen, you know, the, the, the power, I think, of the Obama campaign showed us that grassroots donors can, you know, uh, play with, with, you know, big money. Um, it, it's, it's great getting, you know, one donor to give you a million dollars or 10 or a hundred. It's also great to get a million people to give you a hundred dollars, right? Those numbers still add up. And so part of it is like, we have to also utilize the connective tissue of the black experience of the black diaspora and connect it to us moving forward in a positive light in, in, in politics. Uh, we are very giving people. We are the most charitable people in this country, but we give it to Howard, right? Or to our churches or to our fraternities and sororities. We don't really give as a community towards politics. It's a learned behavior. To Charlie's point, we only been voting for 55 years, um, you know, at least having the right to vote. And so all this is still a, a, a process of learning and breaking down these systems. Um, but I got hope. Like, I will bet on us in any given time. Um, we talk about all the problems, but 2018, we elected more Black people to statewide office, which is a big deal in this country, um, than ever before. We have Black attorney generals in New York, in Minnesota, in Illinois, in Nevada, uh, Black lieutenant governors in Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Illinois, uh, Virginia, New Jersey. Um, and so we're, we're making progress um, slowly but surely, but, but yeah, it's tough. I ain't going to um, re refute that point that, that you made, Josh. Also, too, to, to, to talk about what Clinton also said, too, just as he was saying about understanding the criminal justice system, even the bail system of when brothers get arrested, um, they can't get out of jail because they can't post bail. So being able to reform and come up with a reform bail system is what allows people to understand because the longer you stay in jail, then you tend to you're gonna be there in order to do your time. And, that, and that's the unfortunate part. So there are so many layers in the criminal justice system that we don't understand and how it, it's set up basically to keep us down. You know, uh, we don't get those, um, and I'm just keeping it real and keeping it family here as they said, we don't get that uh, when we're driving in the neighborhood and we may have been drinking or smoking and the cop stops you and pull you over and you say, hey, and he says, hey, Charlie, how you doing tonight? And you'd be like, ah, uh, you've been drinking uh, and you're in the neighborhood. He might, but you know what? Let me escort you home. We don't get those calls. You know, we don't get that opportunity. Unfortunately, what we get is get out the car give me a breathalyzer, or even if you're not doing anything, why are you in this neighborhood? So it's all about making sure, and you have to know how to handle yourself in the street when, that, when those cases happen. And what fails us sometimes is that some brothers don't, or we panic because of what's been going on and the trauma that is in our community. So there are a lot of times, and then of course the racist cops that stop us. So you just have to understand that we, it's so many layers. Uh, and like Quentin said, for us not to be reactionary, but to be proactive. And it's good to see all of these black prosecutors that are in these now systems that are trying to reform, you know, uh, what goes on. And it's hard being black and talking about being a prosecutor. And we know that all too well. So the more we educate ourselves, about what's happening in our community, um, the better we'll be. But I got hope like Quentin, you know, because the bottom line is we know what we need. We need, the, it's all about the candidate too, you know, having that candidate that can connect with those others on so many different levels. And you know, it's all about how we go from the barbershop to the boardroom, right? You need those candidates. That's what Obama did, you know, being a community organizer. He came in and he was like, starting on the street levels and I'm working my way up, state senator, regular senator, boom, president of the United States. And that's what you have to do. A lot of these people have a plan on what they want to do, but they know how to connect and build that, build that, um, uh, build that hope that a lot of people want but they are listening to individuals. And when you come into the black community, if we feel like you are being, if we are being heard, then you will have somebody that will be able to connect those dots for us and be able to take us, um, you know, and, and really do well for our community. We want black liberation. We probably won't get that in our current country. 
So everybody just understand that, right? Capitalism is a racist economic system. We understand that. Are you going to stop buying food? No, you're not, right? Like, so I think it's just that, that, that we got to deal with the complications of the issues. Um, and so it, I get passionate about it because nobody's telling you to like go on a date and marry Joe Biden. No, we're just saying like, have a one night stand, like go to the polls, like, you know, just, just get it over that. with. Um, and, 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 and so again, I'm, I'm making light of it, right? But like, yeah. it's it's true though, right? Like, I think we got to stop laugh. looking at politics like it's it's some love affair. Like it's not, you know? I can find plenty of things to complain with every Democratic candidate I've ever voted for. However, they are more likely to support my agenda and provide change for my community than the other candidates. That's all this is. It's it's a uh, who who is better, right? Which is better? It's not a which is the ultimate change maker, and this one vote is going to change the course of American history for the better. That's not going to happen with Joe Biden or anybody. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe Obama in his campaign um, lulled us into this thought that um, you know hope and change are eternal from one one vote or one election cycle. And that's just not the case. Um, and you can't be a single issue voter. It's just not going to happen. You know, uh, it, life is complicated. You know, people make choices and people make decisions. If you wanted to hold someone accountable for all the decisions that you made in life, then boy, I don't know what plane, you know, you're on. But I, I mean, I wish I was that perfect, you know, as an individual. And you just can't be that way. You have to realize that there are people out here that's going to make mistakes. And some will make, make some policy mistakes that might not benefit you today. Or, you know, or, or they made decisions 40 years ago, but it's impacting you today. So we got to get past, you know, we can't go another four years. I do not want to hear about the crime bill in 2024. We heard about it in 2016. Yeah. We hear about it again in 2020. We can't hear about it again in 2024 or 22 even. We got to be about the business of making sure that we put people in place in order to reform the system. Point blank, period. And, and in the Black community, the narrative that we have is what has the Democratic Party done for us lately? You know, that's what I hear from the brothers. What has the Democratic Party done for you Like, We ain't going to never get uh, what the majority gets because we really are, we're 13% of the population. You know, we are the minority, you know, but we do have a seat at the table and getting a seat at the table and crafting out and making sure that you understand, like Quentin said, signing the census and, and making sure you sign up. So therefore all the resources does come do come to your neighborhood. So therefore you will have your voice. You know, I, I do want to ask another, another thing that I hear often, and I believe Quentin, you mentioned this earlier about the importance of getting involved locally. Um, how important is, you know, is it is it more important to be locally active or, you know, nationally active? Yeah, I mean, you, you got to do both. Um, but but I think for many of the things that we are seeing um, illuminated now, uh, especially, you know, regarding policing, regarding schools and education, um, you know, those two things I think are really critical in our community. Even, you know, healthcare, who responds with 911 calls, police or actual healthcare workers, those are all local conversations, local decisions. Um, you know, these cities, people forget, like, these cities have billion dollar budgets. Um, I was, you know, reading this week, Cleveland was ranked the poorest city in the United States, the city of Cleveland. Mm. The annual budget in the city of Cleveland is a billion dollars. Like there's money there, right? Um, and so it's on us as voters to be able to decide what do we spend this billion dollars on? Do we take 500 million to spend it on, on police? Or do we think about our schools and think about economic development opportunities? Um, do we think about the environment? Those are all local questions and conversations. Now, the state government, federal government, they can come throw some, some money on top of that, right? And expand that kind of stuff. But for the most part, these are local conversations. Your local school board member, local city council person, um, your, your mayor, your, your county um, you know, officials, those things are where a lot of the issues that we're talking about solving actually get solved. And I think you need, um, 
let's just take a case in point. I think this is a history lesson that for a lot of younger guys, they need to do. They need to go back and watch the film Maynard. And it's about Maynard Jackson. It came out in 2017. It's about Maynard Jackson, who was the mayor of Atlanta and how he transformed Atlanta from a small little town. Atlanta and Birmingham, me growing up in Georgia, he became the mayor in 1973. Atlanta and Birmingham were the same size city back then. He transformed Atlanta into what it is today, a world-class city. And he did it on the local level. He did it being the, known as the father of affirmative action. He did it because he gave everybody a seat at the table. And he did that based on the fact that Jim Crow laws, when he grew up, he saw that. In the southwest side of Atlanta, they call it the SWATs, it was known for having blue light in the basement parties. Those parties were also political parties where guys, black men, got together because they could not go on the north side of town in Buckhead and have conversations. And they sat and they plot and they planted how they were going to take over Atlanta, Georgia. He's a Morehouse man. He understood the importance of what it meant to build wealth and build it with, from within. And so Maynard Jackson, Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, everybody has flown in and out of Atlanta. He left a legacy of black mayors, One, two of them from Howard, Kasim Reed and Shirley Franklin. Being that, and now you have another black mayor, uh, you know, from fam, Keisha Lance Bottoms. So he left a legacy of what it meant to be a mayor, to transform a city, to get pe black people involved in local politics that will also, you know, elevate them to the national level. And as you can see through the history of Atlanta, it's a good case in point. And it's a good case study for how politics are done right. Now, is everything done perfectly in Atlanta? No. You know, they had some hiccups there too with a couple of the mayors, but at the end of the day, he left such a legacy. Black businesses grew by being vendors in that airport. So those are little things and little nuggets where if you have a child or if you wanna know why it's important to get involved in politics and how you can make change, that alone, that movie is so invigorating and it's show it's like a it's like a lesson plan on what to do and what not to do and how to be bold in your actions on what you want to do when it comes down to setting policy. So things yeah. like that shows you why you want to get involved on a local level. What 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 changed from when you were coming up, uh, Charlie? When you were eighteen and you know voting was such a big deal up until you know now. Like, what do you see as some of the things where maybe, you know, somebody that's 18, 19, like, man, if I vote, I vote. If I don't, I don't, you know? Right. I, 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 think, I think it just comes down to, one, uh, unfortunately, um, I was fortunate to have a father who showed me the way and who talked to me every day about the importance of what it meant to be a black man. Um, and he spent time with me, and just through his actions, I saw it growing up and he put me in positions to see that. I don't think everybody has those opportunities, you know, uh, and that's why it becomes very important for black men who do have those opportunities to reach back and be mentors to those black men. And um, so that therefore they will have that vision of what it means to be a professional black man and to go right and do what's up. I think technology also too, uh, we are, we're a busy society right now. Parents are not, you know, really teaching their kids and talking to their kids. The school system has really just evaporated everything about history and civics in our classroom. So nobody knows exactly what it means. And that's intentional. That is, don't, don't take that lightly. That is intentional, um, you know, because the bottom line is if you don't know, then you won't ask the questions or you won't be, you know, excited about learning what, what goes on there. Quentin, do, do you think that uh, voter suppression is a is a real thing? Yeah, and I mean, not only do I think it, I mean, it, it's, it's proven, right? Um, and, you know, not, we got to go back to the 60s, like right now, um, if you look at what happened, what's happening right now with mail-in ballots, um, you know, if you're a black voter who is returning a mail-in ballot, you have a 100 um, and like, I think 10% chance uh, or, or higher chance of your ballot being rejected than a white person. 
Um, and so, yeah, this is definitely voter suppression. Um, wow. Before. And yeah, and so again, right. part of it is, and that was, I think, in one of the swing states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, I forget which one. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a real thing that we gotta you know, get, get some concerned about. But here's what I'm hopeful about, Josh. Um, so right now in the state of Florida, 18% um, of all black voters have already requested their ballots be sent to them. Um, in Pennsylvania, 20% of all black voters have requested their ballots. In Michigan, 24%. Um, and so we're seeing black people in these critical swing states step up. Um, I think Georgia's around 20% as well, step mm -hmm. up and request their ballots um, early. So we know they're gonna be voting and we're excited about that. Um, the, 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 the key thing though is to make sure that vo those votes are counted um, those votes aren't thrown out for, you know, clerical errors around signatures and that kind of stuff. But but that's, you know, that, that gives me hope about our ability to um, outmaneuver the suppression tactics. Uh, mail is throwing a wrench into the entire GOP's playbook here. Um, and, and again, as a society, no matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, you should want more folks to vote, have more access to vote. Um, I mean, I can do my taxes right now. I'm on my phone, but I can't like vote mobily, right? I mean, it's all these things that we do securely um, through these devices and, and through technology, but voting is not one of them. Why is that? Um, so it's a very interesting debate that we're going to continue to have over the next few years in our country. But yeah, we got to secure the ballot. What are, what are some things that, you know, maybe a novice may not notice that is, <clears throat> but you would pick up on right away this voter suppression that somebody may not even you know, no, somebody might say, well, mail-in ballot or whatever, that, no big deal. But you might pick up on it right away. Yeah, I mean, the, the mail-in ballot thing is one. I mean, you got to remember, the 2016 election was decided by 77,000 votes, right? Um, which, you know, I think about going back to HU, I mean, there's probably that many people between, you know, U Street and campus, right, who, who live and work and do all that. So a very small number of people decided the fate of the country four years ago. It's on us to understand that and protect every single ballot. So if you throw out 10,000 votes in a certain state, that could literally swing the election. So that, that, that's one thing. One other thing we saw in Virginia, um, we saw Trump supporters uh, who put large flags um, on their trucks um, and rode around the uh, early voting site in Virginia where a lot of people of color were voting. Yeah. In addition to what Quinn said, also too, closing polling locations in places, yeah. uh, closing early. Um, like you saw it in Milwaukee in the past election that they had when they closed down, basically, I think it was something like 40 locations down to one. Uh, and they had people standing in line doing COVID um, when they were trying to vote and stuff of that nature. So you see that one of the most important positions in the state election is the Secretary of State. We witnessed that through uh, 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 the election in the governor's election with uh, Stacey Abrams uh, and Brian Kemp. Brian Kemp was the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is the one who actually counts the votes. And so that is an important position outside of being a prosecutor in the state elections and your judges that you need to know. The Secretary of State is really key and really important um, uh, you know, in these states. They make a lot of decisions and it really affects a lot of things that we do. You know, I'll, 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 I'll give you one more example real quick is that that's just election day itself, right? Why is that not a holiday? Why do you have to take off work or leave work or whatever? Um, uh, that, that, that's an encumberment to our ability to cast our votes that we don't actually have the time on all of our calendars to go and vote without you having to worry about work or school or kids and all that stuff. <laughs> now, I want to ask so I Quentin the same question because I, I would imagine that Quentin, you probably use social media quite a, you know a lot in helping folks get get elected. Um, yeah. What, so, what do you think about about that? Yeah. So, so my my personal recommendation for you and other listeners, um, I, I would encourage you to log off. Some of your social accounts, um, you know, you don't got to delete your account, but like, for instance, on Facebook, it's not on my phone anymore. Twitter, not on my phone anymore. I do keep IG because I have a little bit more of a community on IG that I can restrict. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think um, having 
so much of our energy and attention be given to these social networks is one healthy, um, but two, uh, it is allowing manipulation into our decision making, which I think we all need to be approaching this election cycle and election season with a little bit more protection over our own uh, in our, our our friends and family's mental um, and 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 kind of psychological you know health, just to be very transparent. The kind of shenanigans we're going to see um, over the next couple of weeks, they make me nervous. Um, but there's so much riding on this election. Um, I mentioned the domestic policy issues. Um, but to Charlie's point, I mean, the, the international implications, right? Um, you know, you ask any, any military expert, they'll, they'll ask you, you know, how do you bring down a country, right? You bring it down from within. Um, and racism is the most divisive issue in our in our in our country um it has been since the inception of it and so that has been weaponized so so all that comes from and is amplified by social media in my opinion um and so i'm kind of stepping away a little bit um i i you know i, I do have accounts for my kids this I haven't ever posted but i i do want them to kind of have that digital footprint um when they become of age because uh, who knows how many of my kids names there will be in the next, you know, 18 years. So I do want them to have that space. But yeah, uh, it's it's tough, man. And it I don't know if I'm providing more hope or or not. But yeah, I I, uh, I, I might go on and post some voting information now, um, you know, here and there. Um, but personally, I'm off. I will say though, I'm we are spending as an organization, you know, about half a million dollars a week on advertising on social media. It is the most highly available data sources of people and micro targeting that we have in this country. Um, being able to match you to your Facebook profile um, is, is next level. Um, your address is helpful, your phone number is helpful, but your online activity, your IP address, your social media profile, that's the gold mine. Um, wow. So we can do so much micro-targeting to individual voters um, uh, via social media that we can't do in, in, in other kind of channels. Charlie, I got a quick question, man, as we uh, come to a close, man. So. COVID comes, the country spends $350 billion at the drop of a hat on the PPP. Um, we, I mean, Charlie, you've obviously, you know, you've lived longer than we have. So you've seen, you know, how, you know, black people have been asking for adequate funding for schools. I mean, we see how schools are funded. We see how all of these inequities um, that we have grown up in, how you know how COVID has kind of shown that they exist and put them on a door front uh, of of a, a lot of folks. Um, when you see, you know, I, I guess you know, for for someone like you, you know, Charlie, I mean, who's grown up in that, and you see how quick the government can fix something, or you know how easily they can be proactive to to fix something. I mean, what what are your um, immediate thoughts, you know, on that? Well, my immediate my immediate thoughts was, bottom line, um, this wasn't for us; it was for them. At the end of the day, um, it was to protect you know white men and their businesses, and to protect them and their. So when they first had the first round of PPP, and they had that money going out. It was the big businesses, as you saw some people like Shake Shack got money. Uh, and it's because they have the law firms and they have the accounting firms and they have the CPAs and the financial planners at the drop of the hat. And so all they had to do is call up Bill. Bill, give me that PPP money. And Bill was on it. And Bill knew the system because Bill had friends at the bank. We didn't have that. You know, if, if you are a black professional, you may have had that. If you're a black middle class person or an entrepreneur, you may have had that. And then even it was a struggle for you to get it. So a lot of people where the PPP money was supposed to go didn't get it on the first round. They got it on the second round. But they wanted to make sure that their friends got the money. Should, should black voters vote with their pocketbook? Hey, you know, at the end of the day, I say no, and it depends. I mean, it depends on who you voted for. Um, and you're not, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm with Quentin on this. I'm from the South, man. I'm a humanitarian. I'm all about people first. 
I pay a ton of taxes here in New York. Um, uh, just by being in New York, but also too, you know, I, you, know the, the, you know, what I do for real estate and the money that I make, I pay a ton of taxes. Now, what I like not to pay a ton of taxes, I'm right caught in that middle where I don't, I make, I don't make enough where it takes me on the other side, and I'm not making <laughs> a little bit where it's keeping me on the poor side. I'm like in that bracket where I'm like getting hit the hardest. So I'm paying for these officers. I'm paying for these firefighters. I'm paying for the streets getting clean and all of that and the meter maids and all that kind of stuff. So, but for me, I'm, that's just me. I, I'm, 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 um, I, I vote with my heart because I want everybody to win. I don't want a selected few people to win. I'm not selfish in that because I see too many. I see my family members. I see my cousins. I see some friends and everybody don't have the same level of uh, ability to have access to certain things. And we are in this country and we know this country to be what it is. And, um, and at the end of the day, um, I just want to see everybody win. And, and I'm not selfish like that where I'm just thinking about me because nothing happens with just me. I'm all about the collective. Quinn, um, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, Pledge of Allegiance or the start. I forgot what it was, but in, in terms of curriculum, what do you think, um, like if you could make, if you could make a, a, a policy decision on what needs to be added to curriculum to more, to give us more equ equity um, in elementary school or just education period, you know, what, what are some things that you would add to it? It's a great question. I think, um, Obviously, civics, just being a little bit more in depth about how we talk about um, civics. I think the other thing is economic development. You know, how we, how, how, or I would change that. I would make it public financing. Um, this would probably be a 201 or 301, but teach people how government takes your taxpayer dollars and invests it in the private sector. Um, both uh, not just on the market and, and through pensions and stuff, but with with tax breaks, right? For for certain um, developers or corporations. I mean, the fact that you have so many huge companies like Netflix that we all watch, they're not paying any any federal taxes. Like, like who? Like why? Like, but that was a policy decision. And so, making sure folks understand that policy can again work for you uh, or work against you, I think, is really important. So. Uh, civics, 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 um, but not just like voting and that kind of stuff, but like the heavy level, like public financing, um, breaking down like where the dollars are going. Mm. Totally agree, man. And, um, you know, I, I meant to ask this question earlier, man. You, you're a millennial, man. <laughs> Is, you throw that in there. Um, slide that in there. I love it. I, I, I slide that. it in there because... I love it. Is, is, is Kanye West really going? Can does he really have a power to, to affect the election if he runs for president? And I said I threw the millennial thing in there because that's got to be the only people that will vote for him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or who's this again, Kanye? Kanye, yeah. Because yeah, you know no. I, I talked to Cameron, and uh, you know Cameron works for the, the Biden campaign, and he's like, they're taking that serious. You know what I mean? Like. They really feel like Kanye can sway votes. And I know you talked about the last election was decided by 77,000 voters. You know, how, how serious is that in your circles that you run in when, when people? No, I mean, it, it's it is serious. And, and, you know, I think part of it is we have to do our job educating voters to, to vote for Joe Biden, period. Um, but again, it's just a numbers game. You know, you take a state of five, 10 million people, um, an election coming down to 10, 20,000 votes. If, you know, three, 4,000 people go vote for Kanye versus, you know, vote for Biden, that's decreasing his ability to win. And so, yeah, it's a serious thing in terms of the numbers. I just, um, Kanye is, was, you know, was probably my favorite rapper. And so I, I look at this from a personal perspective, you know, like I grew up listening to Kanye West. Um, and his music was, you know, the, the, the soundtrack of some of the best uh, uh, times in my life, right? 
So President Lewis, I'd like to ha have you get the closing remarks on uh, on this. Um, I, my, my biggest thing is, is to make sure we understand why black men need to vote and why it's really imperative for black men to vote. Uh, because, um, you know, we start out this conversation and I make sure that we understand, you know, get informed, bottom, bottom line, get informed, understand the facts, understand what's happening in your community. So before you go into that voting booth in November or before you fill out that mail-in ballot, whatever you're going to do, make sure you understand, have a discussion, talk to people in your neighborhood, do the research and understand the criminal justice system. I mean, what's happening, people who are running for office, excuse me, in your particular uh, local jurisdiction. Then take that one step further and start thinking about who's running for your state election. So do you have councilmen running? I mean, a congressman, excuse me, running? Or do you have a state senator, I mean, a senator from your state uh, looking to run? And then of course, understand the issues when it comes on the national level and how that will impact you. So. If there's anything now, you really should be looking at corporations that are in your company. I mean, that's in your job. I mean, in your city, how that's going to affect you, the job market in your area, in your city. Understand the economics of what is going on in your particular local jurisdiction. So therefore, you can even make some better decisions. Also, to understand that you're not always, like Quentin said in the beginning of this conversation, we might not always get the benefits of the elected official, you know, of, of, of our vote. Um, and we might not get the choice that we want and understand there are a lot of issues that are affecting this country. Bottom line is go in, understand the facts, understand who's gonna, um, who's gonna be there and understand that it's very important right now to make the decisions of a lifetime that's going to affect us as a general, as a people. Uh, and think of it as the collective, because I think, as I stated before, black women really understand what's going on in this country, and we need to take note, and you need to have some conversation with some of these sisters and sit around. But if you have the money, give it to your local politicians uh, and make sure you vote and you understand what that is, okay? Thank you, guys. You guys been a great guest. Um, you can, you. Quentin, how, how can people contact you, Quentin, or get learn more about the collective fact? Yeah, you can visit us at collectact.org um, or hit me up on IG at QJames007. And, and you can watch uh, Quinn and his wife date, date nights if, if you're so fortunate. Um, they, they have them on IG, very entertaining. Grab a pull up a bottle of wine and uh, check that out. Um, Charlie, you know, alumni are going to be seeing this. Maybe they want to get involved uh, with, and help you out. How, how can they do that? Yes, um, they can get involved a, a couple of ways. Number one, if you want to get involved in the HUAA, you can email me at president at the HUAA.org. Um, you can definitely tune in. Uh, make sure you uh, on IG and on Facebook, uh, the HUAA. So look for that. Um, that's where all the information is coming. Um, we're sending out all information. If you want to get involved, let us know. Also, too, we're making, like I said before, if you want to get involved in events, uh, programming, service, volunteerism, uh, just reach out to me, uh, and that's how people can find me. All right. Thanks, fellas. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for joining the HU Movement Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.